This has been a fairly brief sort of series, uh, seven questions. I'm sure there are many other questions out there that are being asked that could be addressed, but these were seven that have continued to rise to the top of what a lot of people who are either skeptical or maybe even a little bit curious about Christianity are asking. And I've seen on different blogs and different kinds of uh, websites popping up similar questions to the ones that we've covered right now. And I'm grateful to see that it's kind of being blanketed around many, many different churches. And we're not the only ones answering these questions. And the Bible gives us these really solid answers to these questions. So I'm grateful that you all are taking these questions seriously. And I'm hoping that this series will equip all of us, not only so that we can answer some of them personally, but we'll also have some resources that we can share with others to help answer them in case you come across people that are asking them. We're wrapping up seven questions today with, can you know God personally? Uh, who is this guy? You recognize him. You might have gotten to know him a couple of decades ago with his, you know you're a redneck when, stand-up comedy routine stuff. But he's been known for other things. He did a lot of radio. He's done several different television kinds of things. He was a host on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And he also did the American Bible Quiz, something that he thought was important to him because he realized that the Bible is something that needs to be read. And he thought, if I can do a program that gives people a chance to see how important the Bible is and causes them to want to read it more, I want to be a part of that kind of a show. So Jeff Foxworthy is a pretty upstanding kind of guy. And even though he's got a funny accent and he's done a lot of humor, he's got a really strong walk with the Lord too. And I'd like to begin today's uh, look at Can You Know God Personally with a real brief testimony from Jeff. So listen to this if you would, please. I love these guys. You know, I, I learned um, it's real easy to discard people or, or, or to not think about them when you can put them in a bucket and just call them homeless or addicts or whatever. But when they become Jack and Wayne and Kevin and Solomon, when they become real human beings, it's really hard to turn your back on them. And I think that's what I've learned from this place is, is everybody in here is no different than I am. It's, it's people that got damaged early in life. And, and because of that, they had struggles, but they're loved no less by God than I am. And, and so it's kind of a cool thing to sit around in a, in a room full of men and actually talk about these things. And I, I was telling somebody the other day, if you offered me a, a million bucks, but I had to give away my 10 years at the mission, I wouldn't take the money because it's changed my life. It's made my life better. And how do you put a price tag on that? I found it interesting how he came to be involved with the homeless mission in downtown Atlanta. A friend of his is a pastor at a large church there, and the pastor knows the guy who is the director at that mission. And the director kept calling Jeff and asking him to come and just have lunch with him. And Jeff said, my first reaction was, yeah, what do you really want? You know, he thought there was going to be the big uh, request, like you want some money, maybe you want me to do a free show to help raise money. You know, it always involves something that you want from me. And he goes, I just want to have lunch with you. That's it. I just want you to come and have lunch. So he did. And Jeff came, sat down, had lunch with them. And then one of the guys walked over and started sharing his story. The director said, hey, tell him your story. And he started sharing that. And he said, it was in that moment when I looked at this guy and I thought, wow, if I had been through what this guy had been through, I would be right where he is. But for the grace of God, there go I. He said, he's just like I am. These are just people, but they've been through some stuff and they need somebody to get into their world with them and show them Jesus. And because he said, they could have asked 3,000 other people in Atlanta that are smarter than I am about the Bible. You know, I just hosted the show, but I had all the answers on three by five cards. He said, but why would you ask me to do a Bible study? Because he finally asked the guy, what do you really want from me? And he goes, I want you to teach a Bible study every week for these guys. And he finally started to do that. And now what you see is that he's been there for over 10 years, because I think that's maybe a year old. So probably going on 11 years that he's been doing that every week at the homeless shelter for men downtown Atlanta. Why is that important to Jeff? Because he believes it's important for us to know God personally. Now, I'm going to give you a real primer, and we're going to 
whip through a couple of these things very quickly, and you'll see why in a second, because I've been building this up. There's some meth method to my madness. There are two different basic ways, according to scholars, that we can know God because of He's a revelation kind of God. He reveals himself to us. We don't have to go prying under rocks. He's made himself abundantly available to us. One, through general revelation, meaning that through creation itself, his eternal qualities and his holiness can be clearly seen as we see in Romans. And then specific or special revelation, some scholars call it special revelation, which is having to do with the Word, which is inspired. We talked about that already. And then through Jesus, who is the Word who became flesh. Those are the two basic categories that scholars tend to break them into. It's not important that you use all the scholarly words to talk about it. You just need to know that God's busy revealing Himself. Creation, the Bible, Jesus. Now, general revelation, we covered that pretty carefully in question number two. So if you want to get a deeper look at that, just go back in this series and look at question number two, because we talked about, is there a God and how can he be discerned? And we talked about general revelation there. Now, special or specific revelation, I like the term specific because in terms of logic, you move from generalities to specifics. And so it kind of makes sense to me to think of it in those terms. He's getting more specific because when you have an inspired word in our language, that's pretty specific. You can read about eyewitness accounts of people who came in contact one-on-one -on -one with this person, Jesus Christ, who is the Word who became flesh. That's why those two fall in the same category. God's inspired Word, is the Bible reliable? We looked at that last week, question number six. So if you want to dive into that more deeply, can you see what I've been doing? I've kind of built up on all these things so that you're getting a primer on the revelation of God Himself. B, the Word that became flesh, that was Jesus Christ. We covered that two weeks ago. Is Jesus really God? Question number five. So basically, we've got the whole series that's talking about how can you know God, and today, how can you know Him more deeply and more personally? Now, the Spirit of God, I'm going to spend just a few brief minutes giving you a real fast run-through on all the different things that the Spirit exists to do. He is one of the three persons of the Trinitarian God, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's just as much God as everybody else, but he has some very specific tasks in his job responsibility. Some of these are some of the key verses that you could look up, and I think I probably put those for you in your notes. So what is his job description? Well, he does all these things. He reveals truth. He's come to reveal truth to all of us. He promised, in fact, Jesus promised that he would send the Spirit after he left to go up to be with his Father in heaven so that he could remind them of everything he taught and to remind them of truth because Jesus was the embodiment of truth and to reveal Jesus. You'll never find the Holy Spirit calling attention to himself. That's interesting. He's always there to point to Jesus Christ. It's like his role is to reveal Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus is the one who purchased our freedom because of the atonement. Jesus is the one who accomplished what no other person on earth could do. Now, they're all God, but they each had their different roles to play within the Trinity, and they all respected one another too. So they've created this wonderful example of what it can be like when we mutually respect each other and submit to each other in our roles. And then to convict us of sin. If it weren't for the Spirit, I could get by with doing all kinds of nonsense on this earth that would be very damaging to other people, and I would have no conviction of sin whatsoever. If somebody feels guilty because they do something that they sense is wrong, guess who's responsible for that? It's the Spirit revealing what's right and wrong. There's that innate sense that God has put within every human being. And most people actually do know somewhere deep down if they're doing something that they think is probably against God's standards. And he also brings us to repentance. He's the one who can reveal truth. He reveals that inner angst that we have when we've done something wrong. And he can bring us to the point when we realize... I'm really sorry for that, and I want to apologize for that. It's the Spirit who works in us to bring us to repentance. Then once we've repented and we've confessed our sin, guess who it is that confirms that we've been forgiven? Once again, the Holy Spirit of God himself. He exists to connect us with God. He reconciles us with God so that we can have a relationship with him. Even though that relationship was broken because of sin, he brings us back together again. And he helps us communicate with God, sometimes even when we don't know what to say. There are times when I just don't know how to pray. I don't even know the right kinds of prayers to use because I'm not sure what God wants me to pray in a certain situation. That's okay. 
The Spirit's got us covered. He says that He'll interpret even the groanings that we can't express, and He'll interpret that to God the Father for us. So He's sort of a mediator in prayer that way for us as well. And He connects us with other believers. There's that sense of unity that gets together, just like our Haiti team that's down in Haiti right now. I'll guarantee you that when they saw those pastors, they were going to be slapping handshakes and hugging each other and doing all that stuff because they're connected through the Holy Spirit because we serve the same God. And uh, that's one of the Spirit's roles, also to guide us with God's wisdom. You read all through the book of Proverbs, and you can find abundant evidence that it's the Holy Spirit who's at work revealing the wisdom of God to us as believers. And he's constantly working on us. With some of us who are knuckleheads that we need more work than others, he's working overtime to transform me to be like Jesus. And I'm grateful that he is so persistent and so patient because I need multiple times getting into that word so that he can start doing that with me. And then he empowers us to share the gospel message with other people, the good news. All those things are things that the Holy Spirit does for us. Can you imagine trying to do all those things in our own strength or power? forget about it. It's impossible. That's why we need the Holy Spirit at work in us to do all those things. We know, I've mentioned this before a couple of times in this series already, that it was the Spirit who revealed the truth about Jesus' own identity to Simon Peter. When Jesus said, who who do people say that I am? They gave him a bunch of different answers. Yeah, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter says, you're the Christ or the Messiah, the promised one, the son of the living God. And Jesus gives him an attaboy, and he goes, yeah, you got it right. But you should know, Simon, that you didn't figure that out in your own strength. You didn't come to that because of your own human intellect. It was my Father in heaven that revealed that to you. Well, how can the Father do that if Simon can't see the Father? Through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is at work revealing the truth about Jesus, his identity, his character, and the work he did on our behalf from the atonement. Now, I would be willing to bet that none of you in this room could identify this man simply from his picture. The reason I would think that is because he was a very behind-the-scenes, humble person, and you can't find too many pictures of him. And yet, he was one of the most prominent men in Wheaton, Illinois, founding Tyndall House Publishers. How did that come to be? His name is Ken Taylor, by the way. He was going to work on the train one hour each way from where they used to live outside Chicago, and he was working in Chicago. And he wanted to do something to try to get the word to his children. And so he realized that by reading the Bible to his children, especially when he's getting into the writing of Paul in the New Testament, that some of those words were hard for those kids to understand. And so he started rewriting or paraphrasing in simpler language for his children's devotional studies while he was on the train, these paraphrases, and he started with some of the New Testament books. Well, that became uh, published, the first, I can't remember if it was Philippians or Colossians, I think it was one of those two, became published as a paraphrase of just that one book, and it just went crazy. So then he started working on, on others as well. And it took him 11 years to paraphrase the entire Bible. And he did that mostly on the train going back and forth to work. He did that so that his children could understand God's word more effectively. Then, because it was just a paraphrase, people were saying, oh, you can't trust that. It's only a paraphrase. It's not a true translation. So after he had started Tyndall House Publishing, because of the royalties from all these Bibles, most of which he poured into translations to get out to other people, then he got this group of scholars together, some of the best of the best, and had a huge team pouring over that. And for the next decade, they worked on doing an actual translation. So when you see the NLT, New Living Translation, that's Tyndall House Publishing, and it was from this guy, Ken Taylor. Now, here's the story that I found remarkable. When I worked for Neighborhood Bible Studies in New York, I was going to go out and speak to some of our volunteers in Wheaton. And the lady that was going to host me, she and her husband were going to host me in their uh, home, but he was on a mission trip. And she didn't think it was right for me to be in her home since it was just she and I. So she said, we've got somebody in my Sunday school class from church. They have the gift of hospitality. She loves to cook. And I said, I'm in. And it's Ken and Margaret Taylor. You'll be staying with them. And I said, well, that's great. And then she said, Ken Taylor. Ken and Margaret Taylor. And I said, that's nice. I can tell by the way you're looking at me that I don't know who Ken and Margaret Taylor are, and I probably should know. And she told me the story about the translation and and that kind of stuff. And I said, that Ken Taylor? 
I get to stay in their house. Yeah, and she's a good cook. I said, I know you said that. I, that's really cool. But So I go to this really modest three-bedroom ranch home, the same one they'd lived in for years, raised 10 children in that little home. He had all this money coming into Tyndall House, and he lived very meagerly because they poured all the money right back into translations, as I mentioned. He is the real deal. And Margaret really is a good cook. Because she made homemade bread. It was scrumptious. We had some great homemade soup. And we had, oh, it was a wonderful time. He loves to play Scrabble. They said, would you like to play a game of Scrabble? And I said, I'd love to play Scrabble. Don't ever play Scrabble <laughs> with the guy that wrote the Bible. <laughs> he killed me in Scrabble. But then he said, he's so humble. He said, uh, he had something going wrong with his throat several years earlier, which means that he had to stop doing speaking engagements, even though he used to be very busy. So he talked kind of like this. And he said, uh, God did that, I think, on purpose. Because if I had kept up the speaking engagement schedule, I never would have gotten through the translation. And so there was a testimony even in that. But he said, my autobiography has just come out. They wanted me to write down how the translation came to be. And I said, you don't, you don't want me to write that. And they said, no, we, we think it's important. He said, so I have a bunch of copies, and they told me to give them away. So if you'd like a copy, I'd be happy to give you a copy. And I said, yeah. Here's the man who wrote a story about how God works to translate the Bible. He had a, a, a picture of Tyndall on his wall in his study that I looked at that reminded him of people that literally gave their lives to try to bring God's word to other people. And they were martyred for doing that. And it, it reminded him every day of the burden of trying to get God's word into other people. So here I am in a bedroom 30 feet away from where he and Margaret are sleeping, because there's his office, a bathroom, and their bedroom, and I'm at the other end. I couldn't sleep, because I'm in there with this book, reading all these life stories about the man who's sleeping right down the hall. What an experience. So I didn't sleep a wink that night, but I had all this energy, and then I had all these questions to ask him at breakfast the next day. It was remarkable. And here's the deal. I could have read that same book and never have met Ken and I still would have been amazed, but I'm even more amazed that he was so approachable. He was so accessible. He was such a real guy. And he treated me like just any other person that he would have invited into his home. And he became my friend in the little time we were there simply because he was that kind of person. That's the kind of attitude that God has toward us. We can read in a book all about God and we can be amazed, but he invites us further. He invites us to go even deeper because he wants us to talk with him personally and he makes that available through prayer. And as we open that word and then as we pray and as the Holy Spirit does all those things that we talked about, we do get to know him. Look at this from the message, Acts 17. Starting from scratch, way back at the beginning, God made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find Him. He created all of this so that we could connect with Him and get to know Him deeply. Here are five ways that we can grow to know God more personally. First, make Him a priority in your life. I knew of two football guys. They grew up about a mile apart from one another. They used to ride their 10 speeds back and forth to each other's house. And they would play football in the front yard a lot. And one of them had a real good arm. He was such a great, uh, strong arm quarterback kind of guy. But one of the guys was a little more social than this one fellow who had the good arm. And he would wear out after about 15 or 20 minutes of throwing the football around. And he would say, hey, uh, my buddy wants to go and cruise in his car around a little bit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jet. I'm out of here. See ya. Have fun. The guy'd say, okay, that's fine. And then he would stay after it and try to throw through a tire that he hung from a tree and work on his aim. And he would do that sometimes an hour, hour and a half more, always working on that football stuff. When he wasn't playing football, he was watching football and trying to find out more about the game and to look at the coaching and he memorized the stats and he could tell you all the players' names. Based on just those two guys and their little bit, what little bit you know about them, guess which one of those two went on to become an NFL football player? the one who just put football as his priority. If somebody says, well, I don't think you can really know God very personally, I would say, have you put any effort into knowing him? Those who make him a priority can put 
God first in their lives and it becomes very personal to them, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God. That means we have to set aside some other things in our lives if we're going to put this up as a priority. Everything else is worthless, says the Apostle Paul, when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded. That means he chucked it. It's like going to the the landfill, going to the dump, and just dumping it out with shovels. I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. And this is a euphemism. This is from Ken Taylor's translation, uh, Philippians 3.8, the New Living Translation. That word garbage is very nicely worded in the English language because Paul uses a word in Greek that's much more stinky than that. He uses the term that's basically dung, which means that he considers everything else in his life, and he gave up a lot. He was raised with a good family. He had lots of good friends. He had prominence. Uh, He probably had a lot of money. He gave all that stuff up for the sake of following Jesus Christ, and he considered all that as garbage that was willing to be thrown right out because of the riches that he had in Jesus Christ. He put God first. Number two, stop frenetic activity and be quiet. Now that word frenetic means useless or meaningless or haphazard kind of activity that's not fruitful. And it's amazing to me how frenetic I can become if I think if I just work faster and do more activity, I will feel like I'm doing more. And sometimes if it's aimless, it's really not fruitful activity. It's just activity that's making, more, make, making me more anxious, but it's not really accomplishing anything. So basically we need to stop this frenetic activity and be quiet long enough to actually hear from God once in a while. I have found out, not only in my marriage, but also in reading lots of books and in talking to other couples, that when their relationship started to feel like it was pulling apart a bit, the best thing they could do was not necessarily go to a movie together on a date, because then you're sitting next to each other, but you're still not really conversing with each other. Take these long walks. Put yourself in a situation so that you can actually talk with each other and listen to one another. And that means about the little things in life. Year 16, Joy and I went through that difficult time. I had forgotten how to just listen to what her day was like. And I needed to learn to sit down and say, so, how was your day? And zip my lip and listen. And let her talk about the details of her day. And not just be looking at my watch or checking my phone or doing whatever else I was doing, but to actually listen to her and be able to engage in what was going on there. That's what brings people together relationally. Listen, 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 listen. Listen, so these long walks are important. I found that out in my relationship with God. My freshman year of college, first time away from home, I'm three hours away from where I grew up, and I lived on South Campus, but most of my classes were on North Campus, and it was in Flagstaff, and so I couldn't ride my 10-speed after the snow started to fall. I had some good long walks back and forth between the two campuses, and that's when I could start pouring myself out, not out loud verbally, but I had these great inner conversations with God, and I became so close to him that year. And I realized he is my personal savior. I'm not just growing up saying, well, because I was raised in a good Christian home or I went to church all the time. He became my personal savior that year because I talked to him so much. Be still and know that I'm God, he says. We Americans have a hard time with being still. We just do. I think uh, 15 years ago or so, I tried doing something and said, okay, I I just want you to feel how much a minute feels like if you're being still. And I put a clock on it, and it it was amazing how uncomfortable everybody was in the room. It was like, after about 30 seconds, it was like, oh, man, this is really quiet. I don't know if I can handle it. It's hard for us to be still. My Sunday a.m. routine, I used to kind of get a little annoyed, quite frankly. This is an admission. When I would wake up at 2.30 or 3.30 in the morning with sermon stuff on my mind, because I'd think, come on. I need sleep. And then I started realizing God was actually doing me a favor. It was as though he was waking me up early enough so I could start ruminating on all that I'd been studying that week. And he was bringing things to the surface. And he would remind me of something that I wanted to share that he had reminded me about back on Tuesday. And it started, I don't know, goodness, 10 or more years ago. And now if I wake up at 2.30 or 3 in the morning, I lie there and I, I think, what a precious time. It's just God and me. There's no other distraction. 
I can think through, I can meditate on all the things that he's allowed me to see in him. And there's just this closeness. And I feel like I'm with my friend in that quiet time. And then when the the busy activity starts and I hit the ground running at church on Sunday, I feel more centered. I feel more relaxed. I feel like I know what God wants me to say and I can say it because he's the one who gave it to me and I'm confident that it was him and it's not me making something up. That Sunday a.m. routine for me has become precious. And I love the time he gives me to start pondering those things. So rather than see it as a detriment, I'm now starting to understand that if I'm being awakened, it's time for me to talk to God. And it's just kind of a, an unplanned way of having that together time with him. God friendship is for God worshipers. They are the ones he confides in. If you want to get his wisdom and his knowledge and find out what is, you need to worship him and spend time in his presence. Not just reading the word, but then pondering the word and listening and waiting for him to talk back to you as well. So it's not always just a one-sided conversation. Number three, decide whose value system you value most. It's amazing how many people are influenced by the world's value system. There's an awful lot of people in this value system in the world that would hate people and love things. And Jesus flips that completely around. God wants us to love people and hate the value system of the world. And it's so strange how backwards we can get if we're not careful. So we need to decide, whose value system do I really value? Because if I value God's value system more, maybe I should make some more time for him and being in his word and talking to him in prayer and building that into my day on a regular basis. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means I need to get to know his character. How do you do that? through specific revelation, reading about Jesus Christ in his word and praying with him. You can love people and hate their value system. I know a lot of people in the world don't think that. They think that if we disagree with them, we're bigots and we're hate mongers. And the opposite is true. Jesus loved people and he told them the truth. Of course, he was crucified. So we shouldn't be surprised if people are going to be disagreeing with our value system, even if we're loving in the way we approach it. We might think, oh, if I'm terribly loving and compassionate, they'll have to agree with me. Still, very often, it's not going to happen, but we don't give up. We keep loving people the way Christ did, but we, we can hate their value system without hating them, and they don't really get that. I love people who differ in their value system than I do. I love them. That's why I want them to be able to start to see the, the kind of Christ that I know and love. Number four, talk with God constantly. This is that pray without ceasing that Paul talked about. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Now, I like this one because sometimes our life gets kind of busy and you can't just pull off to the side of the road and have a season of prayer that starts with, Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I have come to you right now in this moment of quiet at the side of the road while freeway people are passing me at 70 and 80 miles an hour. That's not the way life usually is. So I kind of have to have a running, ongoing conversation in my brain. You know, guys, we're good at that. We can do that. While our wives are telling us about their day, sometimes we're thinking, you know, I think the car needs an oil change. And I think I'm at about 5,000. I'm about 2,000 miles past when I should have gotten that oil change. You know, we do that, don't we? We have a running conversation. Don't tell your wife that you're thinking that at the time. (laughs) Make sure that you get re-engaged and listen to her to what she's saying and say, honey, I, I feel you and I'm so sorry that you had that difficulty at work today. But we have these running conversations and all of us can do that even in our relationship with God throughout the day. It can, it can happen. I had a parent-teacher chat with one of my children's teachers in high school. Uh, she kind of had a personality war going on with one of my children. And I could tell this is not gonna end well if this continues down this road. And so I started praying about it and saying, God, how do I approach this situation? Do I wait until the parent-teacher conference and then go in and try to have a chat? Do I make an appointment? Do I go in? Is she going to feel threatened? How can I make her not feel threatened? I was having this kind of conversation as I'm driving, and I sense that God wants me to do what upstanding parents would do, and is to compassionately go in and talk with her about that. So I called, made an appointment. She was happy to see me. I walked in. And then I was actually having a running prayer in the back of my mind as I was having this conversation with her. You know, God, give me the wisdom to know the right words to say with the right tone. Help me to use truth, tact, and timing. Help her not to feel attacked because I don't want her to feel attacked. I want her to feel supported. 
but I do want to try to mediate somehow so that she can start supporting my child in a way that would be more fruitful. And you know what? It worked out great because she heard my side. I listened to her side. I supported her. And I said, if this child is not doing certain things, we want to support you in helping them do their best. And then I made a couple of suggestions and she followed through. A couple of days later, that same child came home from school and he said, wow, Mrs. So-and-so treated me with kindness today. I can't believe it. I didn't tell him, you know, yeah, you, you have me to thank for that. But all of that was an ongoing prayer situation. And in real life, that's what we can do with us. God is with us through the Holy Spirit, so we can go into even some of the most difficult situations, and God is right there with us because we can be praying without ceasing. Number five, trust God when you're suffering. Trust God when you are suffering. Amazing how close you can grow with him. Cast your burden on the Lord. Release it. Let it go. And he will sustain and uphold you. Psalm 55, 22. On our website, if you were to go to the far right on the homepage, this is far right. I have to remember that when I point to, you know, okay, so it's over here for you. And then uh, go to the about and drop down to the very bottom. It has friends of living water. Go to that page, go to the very bottom. There's some things there that uh, are some testimonies from Focus on the Family. And it's trying to help equip people who might be struggling with temptation of suicide. Or if you know somebody who's gone through something like that. It's just a, a rich wealth of information down there. One of the testimonies that's on that site, Alive to Thrive, is Brianne's story. And it's gut-wrenching. It's incredible. She, uh, she has a hard time even sharing it because it was a difficult situation. She said, I used to think of Satan with horns and a pitchfork in a fiery place with this voice that was evil and ugly. And what I didn't realize was that my voice sounded an awful lot like Satan's voice because he got into my head and I was the one saying, you're worthless. You're not worth anything. Nobody loves you. You're a burden to other people. She was saying this to herself over and over and over again until pretty soon that's all she could hear. She said it was, though, it was as though the enemy were shouting at me. His voice got so loud. And so finally one afternoon after school when I had felt like everybody was against me and they were talking about me and I was worthless, I got a huge bottle of pills. I went upstairs. I went into my bathroom. I opened the pills. I sat down on the floor. And it was as though Satan were shouting at me, take the pills, take the pills, take the pills. She said, in the moment of quiet, I heard a whisper that just said, wait. And in that pause, after I heard the word, wait, my mother burst through the door. She saw me, knocked the pills out of my hand, cried with me, hugged me. I couldn't look at her for a while because I, I was so ashamed. She said, but now I know I can listen to the voice of God. The enemy was shouting, but all it took for God was a whisper. And now I know that God tells me, you're a beloved child of mine. You mean something. You matter to me. Nothing can ever separate you from me. My love is that thick. That's Brianne's story. And now she's getting to know God personally and closely. I'll get you out of any trouble. I'll give you the best of care if you'll only get to know and trust me. People like Brianne are discovering this now. She understands that God loves her and wants to have a close, deep relationship with her. If you return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. If you know somebody who used to be in church or they used to be following Christ, they used to consider themselves a believer, but they've sort of wandered away, man, this is for them. If you return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones, you'll be my spokesman. In other words, even the bad things in your life can be used for good for other people. Just like Paul had said, you must influence them. Don't let them influence you. That's that value system that we're talking about. If you value God's value system more than you value the world's value system, then you can get into his word and you can know how much he loves you, enough to give his life for you. So make him a priority. Stop frenetic activity. Be still. Decide whose value system you value most. 
Talk with God constantly. Even have a running conversation with him through prayer. And trust God when you're suffering. Those things will, I am confident, help you grow to become more personally connected with God. Now, let me finish up with one more story from Jeff Foxworthy. He shared this one in a testimony on YouTube. He said when he was first going to that mission that we looked at, and he told you about that in that little testimony at the beginning, he said, I didn't know what to say to these guys. I didn't know if I would connect with them, and I wanted to try to get them talking. He said, sometimes they're used to going to church, and what happens in church? You sit and listen, and this guy talks. I like what we've been doing. He said, but I wanted them to be able to get engaged and talk. And he said, so I, about the second or third week that I was there, I finally just threw the word out and said, well, what is the Bible to you? What is the Bible? Just trying to get them to say something. And uh, one guy said, that's just a book of rules. And so this guy that I brought with me, this great big guy named Chicken Man, Chicken Man saw an empty trash can sitting over by the wall. Chicken Man walks over, grabs the trash can, puts it in the middle of the guys in the circle that we were sitting in, and he just puts the Bible right down the bottom of that trash can. He says, well, if it's just a book of rules, if it's just a book, then why do we need it? And this great big guy named Wayne stood up. And Jeff says, I looked at him and thought, oh, And Wayne walks over and he goes, hey, don't do that. And he gingerly reaches down and picks that Bible up. And Chicken Man says, why not? If it's just a book. Wayne says, well, let me tell you a story. He said, my mom passed away. And when she did, I inherited $70,000. And as human beings are usually when we're given too much, we don't do well with a lot. He said, "My, uh, my girlfriend and I partied hard. And we smoked a lot of crack. We drank a lot. And when you smoke crack and drink all the time and you're partying all the time, you don't go to your job. When you don't go to the job, you don't get paid. When you don't get paid, you don't pay your rent. So we lost everything. We lost our house. We started hanging out on the opposite side of town, the bad side of town. We were going from CD motel to CD motel, trying to find people's couches to crash in. He said, I had about five suitcases and two backpacks with everything I owned, and I tried to drag it with me. But we were so strung out so much of the time that I would start losing stuff. And eventually, I eventually lost that one backpack, which had my Bible in it. It was my one connection to my mom because it was one that my mom had given to me when I was a kid. And inside the cover of that Bible, she had written me a love letter and told me how special I was to her. And it killed me that I had gotten so deep into this drug addiction and that kind of lifestyle that I lost that Bible And he said, then for another year and a half after that, I begged people for money on the street just so I could get high and stay high. Year and a half. Finally, some guy came along and he said, hey, I need somebody to help me clean out an apartment that I bought and I'm going to transform it and I'm going to turn it into something useful. He said, "Uh, you want to do some day labor? I'll pay you this much per day. He says, sure. He's thinking, money? Yeah, I could do that. So he goes out with them. They drive 100 miles away from Atlanta to this apartment. And he, he said, I must have done a good job because he came back a week later and he wanted me to go back and do another day doing the same kind of work. And he said, I need two guys this time. He saw a guy read a newspaper over there, another homeless guy. He, he figured if he can read, he might be useful. So the two of us go to this apartment. He says, I'm downstairs and I'm sweeping and cleaning up stuff and just doing dirty work. And this other guy that was with me was upstairs and I could hear him clomping around and he would fill up bags with stuff and then he would drop the bags out the window And then I would go and get the bag and take it down to the end of the parking lot and throw it in the dumpster. And then I heard the guy stop. And so I went upstairs to check on him. And I said, hey, you missed some stuff over here. And he goes, no, no, that's that's stuff that I think might be worth something. The guy told me to go ahead and set it aside because we might donate it to, you know, a thrift store or we might be able to get some money from it or something. And he goes, oh, okay. He says, so Wayne goes over and starts sorting through this stuff in the corner. And he sees a book that looks kind of familiar. And he picks it up, and it was his Bible. And he looks inside, and there's the love letter from his mom. He said, I sat down, and I just started to sob. And I said, God, if you're chasing me that hard, I think I need to be found. And I gave up. I gave up running that day. And he has been clean and sober for three years. And now he's working in a transitional house, helping other guys get clean and sober and working their way back into society. 
and that's Wayne. If you don't think God wants to have a deep and personal relationship, He really does. He wants to know every single person that intimately, and He's willing to chase us down to get us to the point where we'll listen and see, yes, I love you that much. Let's pray together. Father, you just continually amaze me. You blow my mind when I hear stories like the one that I've just shared. And there's so many of them. There's so many stories of people who realize that you are a God who cares about us. You cared so deeply that you sent your one and only son. That's how much you love the world. So that he who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved and will have eternal life. And that that eternal life starts right now on the planet. We don't have to wait until we die before we can start enjoying it. You want to start transforming us and giving our life purpose and meaning and all the, all the blessings that you have stored up for those who love you. And I pray that people will surrender into your loving arms. That they will accept your grace and that they'll start living for you because you're that kind of God. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.